Hello. <laughs> this is one of our late night dispatches. I finally get around to making a lecture video. Um, we're going to be talking, this is the first of uh, probably three videos on social stratification. And so in, in Zoom, we talked about how we think about the American class measure, uh, why social class is different from other stratification systems like slavery, the caste system, and the estate system. Uh, and that notion of life chances that we get from Weber. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, primarily tonight, tonight, it's almost midnight, uh, is the the way we measure class in America. So the starting discussion already is that class is economic in America. We think of an economic ladder. So the way we think of the American dream, the way we think of you know what's working class, what's the wealthy class, wealthy you know money. Um, you know we use an economic scale, right? It's not about how spiritual you are or what a good person you are or how much you've done your to your community or how many friends do you have on Facebook or likes you have on Instagram, unless you're an influencer, I guess. Um, so this is about sort of the four measures that we use to talk about class. And this is just a, a, an opportunity to highlight some of the things that sociologists talk about when we talk about class. All right. So the first uh, measure, let's just go through these. The first class, me class measure we have, um, which is probably the most popular class measure. Again, this is how we measure where people are on our stratification ladder, which is an economic ladder. The first measure we use is income. How people make money. What is your paycheck? How much money do you get paid for the work that you do? This is the primary measure of income. Uh, and something worth pointing out, you think about, you know, what your paycheck is like, you know, if you get paid every week or you get paid every month or, um, that one of the things to think about is that, uh, income, uh, has been actually been dropping in this country fairly steadily since 1972, 1972, right? That's almost 50 years of income drop. And how do we measure that? We measure that based on the cost of living. Yeah. We're making more money. You know, somebody who was making $50,000 in 1972 might be making $80,000 now, but the cost of living, the cost of rent, the cost of a gallon of gas, the cost of a gallon of milk goes up and up and up. And so when you measure income against what it actually costs to live in America, the amount of money that we're making is dropping. It used to be people would, and this is going to, this whole thing is going to depress people, but it used to be people could get out of college and get a job and buy a house. <laughs> And you were on your way. All you needed is a college degree and you were living the dream, right? You were just on your way up and up and up and up. It doesn't work that way anymore. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about, about that. Um, and there are sort of two ways we talk about income for people or two different ways to get income. The first way to get income is to have uh, a salary. Have an annual wage or a quarterly wage in which you get paid whether you show up to work or not. You know, you might get a job, uh, you know, at a firm or a company where your salary is, you know, $80,000 a year. And the value of that is those salary jobs typically come with benefits. They come with benefits like health care and dental to get your teeth fixed. Uh, they come with uh, life insurance, possibly, or pension plan that you can retire. All those years I worked at PSU, I paid into a retirement fund. Which I've been borrowing from lately. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I got a little frog in my throat over that. <sighs> I guess you don't. Nobody retires anymore. Uh, and so, what you get with a salary job is stability, because um, the other ways we'll, we'll, we'll contrast these two. The other way that you make money, um, it, your income is a wage job, where you're punching the clock. I mean, you, some places you literally, I worked at a record store for years and literally had to clock in <coughs> and then you would wait till the last minute and clock out <coughs> and you only got paid for while you were on the job. And typically those jobs don't have benefits. Those type of wage jobs don't have benefits. You're just, you know, getting paid and that's it. All right, you're paying taxes, but you're not getting any healthcare benefits out of it. Um, and if you get sick at a wage job and can't show up to work, you don't get paid, right? You don't get paid. So wage jobs are typically lower income and are just sort of paying the bills, 
And if you get sick, I mean, this has been the issue with the coronavirus is, you know, people feeling sick. And I'm like, well, I probably shouldn't go to work because I might be contagious. But if I don't go to work, I don't get paid. And if I don't get paid, I don't pay the bills. I'm going to work. <clears throat> um, if I have a salary job, I can do a little bit of planning. I got a little bit of breathing room. If I, you know, if I get sick, I'm not going to lose my job. And also, I can figure out how much money I'm going to be making over the year. Because wage jobs come and go, and that job could be taken away from you very quickly, and you're just basically paying the bills. But if I've got a salary job, and I know how much money is coming in every month, I can do this strange thing called budgeting. I can budget, and I might be able to, here we go, save a little bit of money. I might be able to put a little bit of money in the savings, figure out what my expenses are every month for the whole year. I don't have to worry about health care. I don't have to worry about, you know, putting money into retirement. That's all done. I, you know, there's lots of stuff that I don't have to worry about. Um, so I can budget. And so the goal in America, in most cases, there are some exceptions. In most cases, is to try to move into a salaried position, into an basically an annual wage. You get paid for the year, not for the hour. Uh, now, there are some cases where salary jobs can be kind of low. I mean, you can get you know a forty thousand dollar a year job, which is um, below the median income. The, the median income in America is fifty five thousand dollars a year. So half the people in America make below fifty five thousand dollars a year, and the other half that are working. This is the people that are working. This isn't babies and people in a coma. They're not making any money. And half of Americans are making over fifty five thousand dollars a year. Um, so some, you know, you can have a low wage salary job and there are also high wage, um, high wage wage jobs, uh, people, lawyers, for example, who bill by the hour. Uh, when I do my, tr some of my trainings, you know, I can do, uh, I did a training, a couple trainings last year, uh, for $1,200 an hour. <laughs> I laugh because I don't do a whole bunch of those. But afterwards, I was like, holy shit, I just made $1,200 in one hour. Imagine if you made $1,200 an hour and you work 10 hours a day, 40 hours a week at $1,200 an hour. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, it's sporadic at best. And that's one of the things about that type of wage job is, some, you know, you really got to hustle to get it. So the most part, the what mo people are mostly trying to do is move into... Uh, a salary job and those tend to be higher income with benefits but most Americans and we're going to talk about this have been moved have been moved by the shape of events into um, wage jobs so keep that in mind because we're going to um, we're going to come back to that and of course there's a great division between the top income earners uh, and, the, and the rest of us the top five percent of the American population brings in 22% of the income. So they're making a lot of money, right? Those people that have million dollar a year salaries versus the rest of us that are stuck at $55,000 a year. Um, there's a big difference between the haves and the rest of us. So one of the measures, and that's the most common one, is how much money you make. And we think about this, you know, every April 15th when you have to pay taxes. And speaking of taxes, so this is another thing about taxation is there is a tax structure in which uh, which is a factor in the money that we make because we obviously we pay taxes right we pay taxes on the amount of money that we make and the idea is the more money that you make the greater percentage of the money that goes out into taxes in the 1950s we had a 90 percent tax rate for the top that has come down and down and down and down uh, and so there is a shift that happens in the 1980s uh, and this concept called trickle-down economics. Trickle-down economics, have you ever heard of this? It was popularized by a president by the name of Ronald Reagan. And when he was running for office in 1980, he was really sort of high on this idea of trickle-down economics. Milton Friedman, uh, the great economist, pioneered this idea. Uh, a lot of people weren't too sure about it. And what tr trickle-down economics is, or what the theory is, is since there's a higher tax rate among the people at the top, the small people. So we draw this like a, a triangle or a pyramid where you have, you know, the very super rich people, the Bill Gates, you know, handful of billionaires up at the top. Uh, and then, you know, the, the big middle class and then the, the rest of us on the bottom, and lots of poor people on the bottom. Um, since the people at the top pay a higher tax rate, their hands are sort of tied. They can't invest their money. They can't expand. They get punished for making a lot of money. Uh, and therefore, um, capitalism can't grow. And so what trickle-down 
economics argues is if the rich are freed from taxes, if they don't have to pay the taxes, um, they will be able to invest. They are the job creators. They will be able to hire more people and you know develop more factories and expand their business, and it will be good for the economy. So the phrase of, of trickle down economic uh, trickle down economics is a rising economic tide lifts all boats. A rising economic tide lifts all boats. If the rich do better, we'll all do better because they're good people and want to share it with the rest of us. The reality of this, we now have. 40 years of this, 40, more than 40 years of this, is that um, it don't work. It don't work. What happened with when Reagan came into office in 1981 is huge tax cuts for the wealthy. So they all of a sudden don't pay taxes. Poor people don't pay, t pay taxes. I mean, most of us on the lower rung of the economic ladder kind of look forward to doing our taxes because we're going to get a refund, right? We're going to get a bunch of money back. So if the top is not paying taxes and the bottom is not paying taxes, who gets stuck with the tax bill to fund all the stuff that has to be funded, whether it's the army or building the highway or health care or whatever? It's the middle class. Like the middle class got squeezed uh, by the tax burden that eroded their income is one of the reasons that income has been dropping since uh, or over 50, 50 years now. Um, and so whenever anybody says, you know, we need to cut taxes for the rich or the job creators, don't you believe it? It's a hoax. It's been tried over and over again, and it just screws over the middle class. But, you know, it affects the income distribution because those folks have to pay less to Uncle Sam and keep more of their money, whereas you know, those of us in the middle have to pay for all those services that we enjoy and that the rich people enjoy, too. They just don't pay taxes to fund them. So, so. The notion of income, you know, is, is complex, but basically it's how much money you take home and how much of that gets sent off to Uncle Sam or to the state. And I hope you all survived uh, April 15th this year. I did not, and I have not paid yet. <laughs> I will. We have till July 15th this year. Um, yeah. The other way that we think about, so income is the number one most popular way. The other way that we've Excuse me. The other way that we think about uh, where you are in the class ladder is probably a better measure, and that's wealth. Wealth is different than income. Income is what you make for what for how you work. Wealth is what you own, what we call your assets. Your assets. Uh, what do you have? So think about right now. What do you have? What do you have that if you needed some money really badly, you could sell? What do you have that you could sell? Do you, do you own your car or does the bank own your car? Do you own your phone or does AT&T own your phone? You know, what do you have that you could sell? Some people have some stuff. Look at this. Look at all these records. Well, I could probably sell those records and get a couple grand at least, I hope. I've got some valuable. I will show you my autograph records, but it would take too long. Um, the Ramones. That one's right over there. Um, uh, you know, some people have some stuff that they could sell. Right? I sold off some of my comic books, including uh, my copy of Amazing Fantasy 15, which is the very first Spider-Man autograph by Stan Lee. Oh, I bought it cheap. I bought it for about 100, 150 bucks, I think, and when I was 13 years old in 1977, and I sold it uh, in 2017 for $10,000. $10,000. So buy cheap. And it expands in value and then you sell it. So hopefully you've got something. When your mom's saying, don't throw that away, what she's talking about is you've got an asset. Hold on to it. It will appreciate. It will build equity, meaning value. And then later you can sell it. We uh, we had a little, oh man, a little Star Wars Ray doll in a box that we bought a couple of years ago when the movie came out. And I've been saving it in the box. And my daughter is like, why is it in the box? It's a toy. She, she took me aside and said, Randy, or she dad, she didn't say Randy, she's my child, but she said, dad, um, toys are sad if they're not played with, that toy being in that box is sad, we need to take it out of the box and play with it, and part of me is like, of course, she, I, it's my daughter, she should play with this Star Wars, the other part of me is like, that's an asset, what if, what if it's worth something, Star Wars toy in the original box, we took it out of the box and gave it to her, screw the assets, um, the force is with her. So, uh, so, you know, some of us have that, but, but the best thing to have, the best thing to have when it comes to wealth is property. 
the best thing to have of the wealth is property. How did Donald Trump make all his money? Although we have no idea since he won't release his taxes. He may be piss poor as far, as far as we know. But, you know, the idea is he bought and sold real estate, right? He made his money through selling assets. This is sort of the best way to develop wealth in America, to own property. And Americans have been given a sort of way to create wealth. I mean, think about the best way to own, to have wealth is, you know, own lots of property, right? Because all those people have to pay you rent, whether you own the shopping mall or you own a housing complex, like those people are just paying you all the time and you're just sitting there and the money's coming in, right? To own a property is a great way of doing. Also, the best way to achieve wealth in America, the easiest way that's available to all of us is through home ownership. This is the, the bedrock of the American dream, to buy a house. When you buy a house, it appreciates unless you know we have a collapse like we had in 2008 or like we had in 2021 <laughs> oh sorry uh that uh for the most part the housing the value of housing stock goes up and up and up i bought i mean i'll be honest i bought this house in 1999 uh for 135 thousand dollars it's probably worth six hundred thousand dollars now what did i do for it to appreciate to triple in value quadruple in value what did i do not die all I had to do is sit and watch my watch my watch and watch time pass and the value goes up. And you can't find a house in this neighborhood now for less than half a million dollars. It's crazy because this is the hood. It got gentrified. Uh, but, you know, and I always wish, God, I wish I had a time machine. I'd go back and buy like two houses and be a, be a old landlord for the other one. The best way to create wealth is equity through home ownership. Right, so if I can give you any piece of advice, I'll give you a couple piece of pieces of advice, uh, is to buy a house, buy property, buy, you know, there's a great story of, the, of this guy that bought some swamp land in southern Florida that was worth nothing, and then a little place called Disney said, uh, we want to build Disneyland here, and he's like, what? Well, so, yeah. And he's, you know, he, this completely crappy bottom, soggy bottom swamp plan he sold to disney and made millions because the value goes up right the value goes up with if there's a demand the value goes up so here's the deal on home ownership so home ownership is the way for americans to create wealth you buy a house and you create wealth then you can pass that wealth down if you if you create if you own a house you can take a mortgage out on it at some point and start a business or you can take a mortgage out and help your kids buy a house so they can create wealth, right? It's like this money machine that allows you to create wealth. We're working on a, a, more, a refinance right now so we can remodel our kitchen. Money, just take it right out of the equity in the house. Uh, and then it adds equity to the house and then there's more money. Um, here's the deal. It used to be really hard to buy a house. It used to be, a you know, hundred years ago, it used to be really hard to buy a house. To get a loan to buy a house or what we would call a mortgage, typically it was you had to put half the money down, half the money of the house, and pay it off in five years. So that meant a lot of people, a lot of like average people could not buy houses because if you know, you had a $20,000 house, which, you know, is a fair price for a big house uh, in, you know, the... 1920s, um, you had to come up with ten thousand dollars, and you had to be able to come up with the other ten thousand, and that's a that was a lot of money back then, and so a lot of people were not able to buy a house. Then the depression hit, and so many people were thrown out of work. So many, oh God, this sounds familiar. So many people lost their homes that the federal government started a plan, the FHA loan program, the Fair Housing Authority, and it created a new scheme for. For mortgages. The new mortgage under FHA loans was you only had to put 5% down and you could pay it off in 30 years. So that meant the monthly payments that you were paying to the bank or to the mortgage lender were going to be a lot less than over five years. So it drops the price down because you spread it out over 30 years. All of a sudden, people could buy houses. I mean, that was the idea. The 30-year mortgage made it possible that people could buy houses because you could make your monthly mortgage payment. So, in starting in the 1930s, there was this movement into home ownership, and people started building wealth, and people started accumulating that equity and loaning out the loaning out the money to you know um, help their kids buy houses, and it created this whole 
a new middle class of America. The 30-year loan, the 30-year mortgage created the American middle class. It's as simple as that. It's a little wrinkle on that, though. In 1968, we got the Fair Housing Act, uh, the third and sort of final piece of the civil rights legislation of the 1960s. And one of the things they found is that from 1932 to 1968, uh, of those loans that were given to people to buy homes, less than 5% went to people of color. Over 95% of those 30-year loans were given to white people. The people of color were blocked out because of institutional racism, and let's just call it what it is. And so they weren't allowed to buy homes, and therefore they were stuck renting. And because they were renting, they weren't building equity. They couldn't help their children buy loans. They didn't have money to take out to start businesses. And wealth was prevented for black and brown and other minority groups in America through home ownership. White people had this great upward mobility because of home equity, um, but people of color did not. And it's been a while, it's taken a while to get sort of equality back, but we've known if you, all you have to do is look up predatory lending. We know that in the 2000s, minorities were targeted with these really fake uh, mortgages or said, hey, you want to buy a house, we'll get you into this mortgage. And all of a sudden they, you know, they take out the money and think they're buying a house and the interest rate goes sky high and they're out on the street and somebody's making off with their money. Those primarily were targeting African-Americans. So there is an incredible uh, history of institutional racism in home mortgage lending that explains the incredible wealth, wealth differential between white Americans and black Americans. It's kind of a simple thing. Right? Why, why do white people, on average, have so much wealth? Home equity. Home equity that was prevented from generations and generations of minority people uh, from entering uh, that, that form of wealth, wealth development. Now, before we move on from wealth, I got another p formula to give us. Wealth is it's not just your assets. Wealth, wealth are your assets minus your debts. How much you owe versus how or how much you own, all the stuff that you own, all the records that you own, and the house that you own, and the cars you own, minus what you owe, right? What you got versus what they want from you. Uh, and so a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people have actually have negative wealth because you take what you own. Like, I don't own this house. The bank owns this house. I, I, when I make the last payment at the end of the 30-year period, I will own the house. The bank doesn't own the car that we just bought. You know, we've got like five or six payments into it. The bank owns it. And if I don't make a payment, the bank comes and takes the car. They repossess it. Um, and so, you know, a lot of us uh, think we own stuff, but somebody else really owns it. And so what about credit cards? There used to be a time when they would never give a credit card to a college student because they were a bad risk. They just don't know how to control their money. Now they can't wait to give credit cards to young people because it cycles them into that debt maintenance. You run that credit card bill up, you've got to pay it or your credit is ruined for life. Right, so you make that minimum loan, that minimum payment every month, and you're never paying it down. You're never paying it off. The interest adds on to it, twenty percent interest, sometimes higher. Right, you are never going to pay that off. You become a slave to the banks, and therefore you owe more than you own. The loans that you take out for your education are a good example of debt uh, and paying back uh, the lender for your education. You're actually paying more. In interest, and the sad reality is the money, if you've got a loan for your education at PCC, the money that you pay back mostly goes to the bank. So you pay the bank more for your education than PCC, which is kind of depressing to think about. You could just give it to me. I could use it. I got my own debts. Uh, we really see this breakdown in the wealth differential uh, in race. Uh, because of all that housing discrimination and African Americans being blocked out from um, developing equity because of all the discrimination in housing, the average wealth of a white family in America is 10 times greater, 10 times greater, nearly 10 times. The average net worth of the typical white family is $171,000. 
when you take all their assets and subtract their debts. Uh, the average um, net worth of a black family is seventeen thousand dollars. One hundred seventy-one thousand versus seventeen thousand dollars. The average net worth of the typical Latino family in America is, is zero. Negative wealth, you know, or zero wealth, because th th there's more owed than owned. The assets are limited, and there are a lot of debts. So there you go. Uh, and one of the things about uh, black wealth is it's kind of new because of the 1968 Civil Rights Act that ended officially ended housing discrimination. Uh, it allowed black families to start acquiring wealth and buying houses. Uh, but, you know, they're a couple generations behind. So that explains that incredible gap. Uh, and there's a great video um, I'm going to share with you in the comments below from comedian Chris Rock. Chris Rock, he's so great. We just watched Grown Ups the other night. He's such a great, great asset. I have to think that he majored in sociology in college. And he has a great uh, bit about the difference of wealth, having wealth and being rich. And by rich, he means income. And that those are two different things. And the, the idea of having money is new to African Americans because of the ability to accumulate assets or to accumulate wealth. And I'm going to include that clip because he says it in ways that I, as a white person, shouldn't say it. <laughs> but it's pretty much, he's talking about the difference between uh, income and wealth. And so we'll let Chris Rock do that. Thank you, Chris. All right, the other two are real, are, are real, um, are real straightforward. Uh, the, the third one is education. And education as a measure of where we are in the class ladder is pretty straightforward in a couple ways, but then in a way you might not think of. I mean, obviously it takes money to get an education, right? It takes money. You're not working while you're going to school for the most part. Some people are doing both, which, you know, God bless them. But the idea is that you have the money to pay for college, or you have the money to pay for graduate school or medical school. Of course, those people are, are, are leaving school with tons of debt as well. Um, but, you know, the hope is with education comes more income, right? And the ability to buy a home and generate wealth. So an education is a pathway to economic mobility. And, you know, you'll, you'll talk to people and say, you yeah, know, where did you go to school? And you can kind of use what their education in is as a stand-in for where they are in the class ladder. Where'd you go to school? I dropped out of high school. Where'd you go to school? I went to community college. Where'd you go to school? I went to Harvard. <laughs> Up here, right? There's a measure, you know, there's a way that we, we measure people based on their education. And part of that is the earning potential when you come out. I love PCC. I think everybody who comes out of PCC is going to have a much better life than if they didn't go to PCC. But I'm not hiding any truth that if you come out of Harvard, you come out of Princeton, you come out of Yale, you come out of an Ivy League school, the opportunities are a little bit better. I mean, having gone to Emory, I have to say that that, you know, just mentioning Emory has opened many doors for me because that. But so the first is the correlation. And we know this is a correlation. We know there's a correlation between how much education you get and how much money you make in your life. Right. And I would encourage you. If you have the means to do so, go on to a four-year school, go to graduate school or law school or medical school or pharmacist school or masseuse school, <laughs> whatever school, you know, I mean, stay in school as long as you can, because that, even though it sort of is a drag while you're in it, it's going to increase your ability to uh, create wealth later on. But the other part of this is, it's about who you meet while you're there. It's about who you meet while you're there and the networks that you form while you're in school. So most schools, I mean, PCC is, you know, different than our traditional notion of college because most schools, all the freshmen live on campus and all the sophomores live on campus and almost all the juniors live on campus and about half of the seniors live on campus. The idea is everybody's sort of living together and it's a very intense environment and they're just being students, so that's their main role, uh, and they're hanging out together, and then when they graduate, they've been bonded by the fire of four years of college, and those connections will last them throughout their life. I, you know, I feel really lucky to have gone to a school where, you know, I lived in a dormitory all four years, and I got to meet a lot of different people who I never would have met 
uh, in my college days, and those people are still my friends. Even before we had social media, I was keeping in touch with my friends who are lawyers and doctors and financial advisors. All you know, you have these connections that last a lifetime. My dad wears his uh, Ohio University ring to this day, and it, you know it gives him connections to all the other people from his alma mater uh, that he can be connected with. Also, who are part of his fraternity, Sigma Chi. Uh, and so you build these networks that help you later. If you need a loan, you've got somebody. If you need somebody that wants to tell you where you can invest the extra $2,000 that you got, you've got somebody that's going to help you. You need somebody that can do some plastic surgery on your face, you've got somebody that can help you. Uh, and this is where I think PCC students uh, and, and community students in general are at a disadvantage because being a commuter school, people come to class and they might kind of like look at each other uh, and then they leave. And there isn't the same intense connection uh, that will last much later on. And of course, with coronavirus, it's even more so um, because you know, nobody's interacting anywhere at the lunchroom or the bookstore or on the, you know, on the grass on the quad. It just, do we call it the quad at Rock Creek? Um, that, you know, there is, there is sort of no, all the clubs have sort of died and we'll be back. So I always encourage students to say, hey, even though you're not living in a dorm, you know, on top of each other like we were, get to know each other, you know, become Facebook friends, connect each other, trade phone numbers, stay in touch, because later on, you may be resources for each other, may be able to help each other up. You need a carpenter? Hey, I got a friend who's a carpenter. Hey, you know, you got someone that can help you with your the tax mess you're in, right? I went to school with this guy. And so those connections will help you move up the ladder. So don't don't be a stranger. When this thing's all over, when I click off of the Zoom, you guys should like email each other and be like, hey, do you want to go out for a virtual drink? Um, Sorry, I just depressed myself. Uh, and so, and so, yeah, so uh, education. And the fourth one is related to that, which is occupation. I mean, when somebody, when why do we always ask people, what do you do? What do you do? This is the question whenever you meet somebody. What do you do? Well, like, I breathe, I consume, uh, I spend money. Like, what do you do? I read poetry. Well, why do you know? What is your job? What is your occupation? Because as soon as they say that, right, we know, this is the symbolic interactionist business, we kind of know where they are on the ladder, right? If they say they're a doctor, like, ooh, doctor. If they say we're a garbage collector, oh, garbage collector. Although garbage collectors, I think we rely on garbage collectors on a more routine basis than we do doctors. I can I can do without a doctor for a year. Garbage collector without a year, oh man, that would suck. Without it for a month, that would suck. Um, so, uh, but, you know, we kind of look at how people's uh, occupational positions rank and sometimes that has to do with how much money you make in that job, how much education was required to get that job, who you have to know to get that job. Is it a salary job or a wage job, right? Salary jobs are going to be ranked higher than wage jobs in the most in most parts. And so that's kind of a stand in as well. Um, OK, there's a whole bunch more to come. But those are our four measures of social class in America. Income, wealth, which is better than income. Uh, you know, Paris Hilton is wealthy. I don't know if she still has a job or not, but she's got a lot of asset, assets. Uh, your education and uh, your job. Those are our four measures. Okay. All right. That's it for now. I'm gonna, I got another one coming right after this.